So, hello. Um, thanks for introducing. My name is, uh, is uh, Jan Kundrat. I work for an organization that is called Cessnet. We are a provider of uh, e-infrastructure services in the Czech Republic, uh, meaning that the, our user community consists of uh, users and people from education and scientific, uh, scientific institutions. Um, now, uh, some of our users are using our network for other purposes than just carrying the data. So, for example, we've got uh, one community which uh, is using uh, our optical network to carry an extremely stabilized uh, color, color of a light towards uh, a nuclear power plant where they are actually uh, plugging this color of a light into an optical interferometer that is measuring whether the wall thing is going to collapse or not. So, uh, yeah, it's awesome to work with. It's just not. Um, um, I'm also a software engineer at the TIFF project where uh, I uh, work as a maintainer of uh, GNPy. Now, GNPy is a simulation engine which predicts performance of optical channels as they are traveling through the network. I'm just saying this for completeness, but uh, yeah, this is a Cessna talk, not really a TIP talk, so it's not endorsed by TIP in uh, any manner, of course. So, uh, Cessna, um, we have been uh, creating designs of OLS open line system equipment or open optical equipment for quite some time. Our first deployments happened something like 15 years ago. Uh, we are uh, we are a research institution. We are not a manufacturer, which means that we create these designs we, and we don't rely on someone else to bring them to the market to maybe market them under their own brand or under, or under the brand of Checklight. Um, so everything started with amplifiers. Since these times, we have uh, moved a little bit to uh, some advanced stuff. And the most recent addition are, is an complete open optical line system with SDN rodents. When someone, someone says an, op, an optical line system, they uh, usually show you a picture like this one. So everything starts with uh, a pair of transponders at the end, um, at both edges. So these transponders usually plug into your uh, L2 switch or L3 uh, router on one hand. And on the other side, they uh, are using uh, a uh, slide signal, which is suitable for long-range transmission over the network. Um, what I'm going to be talking about is the thing which actually uh, lives underneath these transponders. I'm very grateful that uh, my uh, that uh, another speaker from, uh, from Juniper mentioned that uh, this open line system or optical line system is a network, but it's not a digital network. It is essentially a network of uh, analog waveguides that are carrying light. It's a uh, you know, it's a high frequency radio system or high, very high frequency system carrying electromagnetic waves. It never hurts to remember this. So yes, one thing which is, uh, which is uh, one property of this picture is that this is a uh, linear topology just from points A to B. A uh, real network tends to look a little more complex. And uh, if you'd like to establish complex paths like this one, for example, you need to have a device which is called RODEM in each of these, these nodes. Now, we wrote them that's a uh, reconfigur reconfigurable optical airdrop multiplexer. And it, uh, so it allows you to slice and dice the spectrum and draw out individual chunks of the spectrum between different uh, IO ports. This is an example of a very simple rodem with just two degrees. Um, degree means uh, essentially direction, a long hole link. So this one has got just two of them, one to the west, one to the east. So it's not so terribly useful, right? So let's add something more useful to the mix. Let's add the capability of uh, inserting and extracting signals locally. This is what this uh, thing called, yeah, called an airdrop box is. And now we have essentially three options. Either the signal could be you know, passing through from between east and west direction, or we can be terminating the signal from the west direction or from the east direction per each wavelength. We can uh, scale the rodem up a little bit by uh, adding more of these directions. We can go to three, four, five degree rodems. We could go even higher, but you know it gets rather tedious to draw these diagrams. So what we could instead do is that we increase the redundancy. As, uh, as you can see, each of these uh, black rectangular rectangles, they represent a certain unit of function of a rodem. And when they are quite often represented by, for example, a cart in a blade chassis or whatever. And uh, whenever a uh, 
a device fails, you lose a certain function within your program. So if you lose one line card, um, of course, there is some degradation of service. But the thing is, if your topology is reasonably developed, with, uh, which usually means um, that your network consists of intersecting rings and there is some redundancy, nothing serious really happens. The service can still be delivered. But if your add drop group fails, now an add drop, it, that's the part of the road and where you're inserting or extracting the client signals. So uh, you would essentially lose all uh, local connectivity, which it, uh, can be mitigated by uh, adding some redundancy and using uh, redundant add drop nodes. So uh, yes. So we, uh, when in our design, we tried to use this uh, modularity that was shown in the previous picture. So we are using one, two pizza boxes for everything. Uh, we've got a one U pizza box per each add drop node. We've got uh, a uh, one U pizza box for each line degree, meaning for for each uh, like long range link. Yeah, and the system allows us to allows us to build a rodem of a degree up to eight. It's quite a lot because in uh, what we have seen in like real world, almost nobody builds rodems of a degree higher than six. That's what our experience says. Um, these devices that we are using for line degrees and for add drops, they are slightly different because, for example, we are integrated into amplifiers like boosters, preamps for the long haul connection. So these devices can have a reach of uh, up to 25 decibels of the fiber attenuation. In uh, kilometers, this is something like 80 to 120, depending on how, how good your fiber is. Yes, uh, if you need to span longer directions, then you just insert more inline amplifiers, essentially up to a uh, certain limit. So this is how these devices look like in practice. The one at the top, it's a, uh, it's the, which one is it? It's the uh, line degree. These two in the middle, these are for handling the client signals, meaning these are other boxes, and one at the bottom, that's uh, the inline amplifier. These are the ports where, which handle the long haul links. These one are for uh, the internal mesh connection within a rodem node, because as if you remember the picture with uh, plenty of boxes and plenty of blue and, blue and green lines in the middle, so essentially each and every box has to be connected to each and every other box in order to you know, be able to route the signals as you wish. And finally, these are the connectors for, for the client signals. So with these boxes, we have all the hardware that we need for building quite a flexible optical line system. Essentially, everything blow transponders. Transponders are not included. Um, there is a bunch of uh, desirable properties that you typically want your modern or well, reasonable rodem to have. One of them is the flex grip property. Previously, the wall C band, the range of frequencies that's uh, suitable for long haul transmission, it used to be divided into a fixed number of channels. Originally, each of them were something like 100 gigahertz wide. Then the industry decided to halve the interval, moving to 50 gigahertz channels. What we have these days is a, uh, an allocation of spectrum which is very flexible, meaning that these signals could be, there are certain, you know, certain granularity, but they are, can be almost arbitrary wide. And they can also be shifted between, yes, so the, the central channels or the central frequencies are no longer necessarily aligned. Yeah, all, we, of course, have all these features, all these properties in our rodem. Um, another property being colorless. Now, this is very useful in, uh, in uh, modern design because uh, many, many years ago when the 1G and 10G transponders were common, not all of them were tunable, meaning that you, it, it was possible to buy a DWM transceiver with a fixed color. Uh, since the move to coherent technology, with, uh, with, which is essentially anything 100G or above these days, uh, you can't really buy non-tunable transponders. So now you can actually retune the frequency of your transponder on the fly via software. So it makes a lot of sense for the client facing ports on your rodems to be able to accommodate this. So they're translated to you know, plain terms, there can't be any fixed max dmax anymore. Last, uh, another property, directionless. Uh, now a client port is said to be directionless if I can reach any, any of these line directions with, uh, with my uh, with my signal. Once again, there can't be any hard-coded direct connections. A contentionless feature, 
a root MS set to be contentionless if it is possible to terminate the same wavelength coming from different directions at the same time. Now, we are achieving this property in accordance with the ITUT definition that I quoted here via having multiple address boxes. So it's not just redundancy, it's also for being contentionless. There are other possibilities on how to achieve this property on the market, of course. We could have used uh, MBI and WSSs, but uh, there are certain, uh, well, disadvantages of that approach, so we decided to go this way. Um, our design has several several different options for the airdrop stage of Rodem. <clears throat> the most flexible one is this one, with, uh, which uh, includes a WSS switch in there. It's very useful for line wavelengths because it uh, really guarantees you that uh, on each client port, there's going to be just that signal that you decide to route there. Um, with coherent transponders, we can, we can, on the other hand, exploit a feature of, co of, uh, of a coherent transponder, because if you've got a coherent transponder and you send, uh, for example, five signals to, to, on, of course, different channels to that transponder, the transponder can actually pick and choose a tune into just one of them, which uh, can save you money. Of course, you can't really use uh, this design if these, uh, if these transponders belong to someone else. So, but on the other hand, if you have if these are yours, if uh, the signals that you're carrying, if they, belong to you, if they belong to you, if you have total control over these coherent uh, transponders, then you can use this, this, uh, this uh, airdrop stage. Yeah, and a very really inter interesting feature because uh, this is a route and select architecture of a road um, It's also possible to use a passive solution with uh, Y cables, essentially 50-50 power splitters. Now. Uh, I wanted to say that this is extremely, extremely reliable because it can't fail. Of course, everything can fail, and everything fails. But uh, I think that you know, um, essentially, a piece of glass tends to have rather bigger reliability score than a, a system that's uh, plugged into electricity and has spinning fans. Yeah, uh, we are also integrating a feature. It's called OSC, an optical supervisory channel. Um, think of it as a uh, it's essentially an integrated uh, filter for, uh, for an SFP pluggable, um, which operates just outside of the C-band, just outside of that piece of, of that range of spectrum, which is suitable for long haul transmission. Um, and it's been used for uh, essentially three different purposes. First of it, it's an overlay network, a low speed network, low speed meaning gigabit, for, so that you don't really need any out of band access to your your, for example, amplifier hats and so on. It's also useful for some laser safety mechanisms. You can use it for neighbor discovery via LLDP, for example, so that you can, um, so these rodents know what is at the other edge of, uh, at the other end of the link. And uh, yes, we have also partnered with one company which integrates OTDR functionality into the SFP, into these SFPs. OTDR, that's uh, something that uh, is very handy when your link goes down because someone cut your fiber, for example. So OTDR is something like, an, like a radar which operates within the optical domain. It sends a sequence of specially coded impulses down the fiber and it listens back to what gets reflected at the fiber cut so it can pinpoint the location of uh, the fiber break. Management, let's come, in, let's come to the control. So, uh, of course, this is an SDN rodem, but it could be a little hard to actually define what is SDN when it comes to working with a radio frequency network, right, or a high frequency electromagnetic waveguide network. So I think that uh, because there are no, no ones and zeros, there are no data packets, I think that we can actually generalize the SDN concept into three different, uh, well, statements, let's say. So first of all, there are no fixed functions. Everything is remotely configurable via software. That's the uh, first point. For example, in a traditional RODEM design, you would get a, a feature for uh, optical path protection that would be hard-coded. Now, with this RODEM design, there is no optical path protection built in, but you've got enough tooling to use a software solution to get you optical path protection. Second property, uh, these, these RODEMs do not really care whether you are using transponders from vendor A or vendor B or modulation one or two, right? Every, for them, everything is a, is a light signal with a predefined set of uh, optical properties. And uh, as long as the signal fits into these properties, the RODEM will guarantee you transmission. And third, um, if, you're, uh, if you're reconfiguring your network, you're usually doing this in response to some events. So you, if you want to make some changes, you have to have a way of measuring them. So there is a bunch of uh, 
performance counters or optical well, performance data monitors. Of course, because it's 20, almost 2020, <laughs> we, are, uh, we are using Netcon for sd not interface with a uh, young data model. Netconf is not the only interface. We also support the CLI, either locally or via SSH, of course. Now, uh, the, there is just one single data store in there, which uh, holds the data, the, the complete configuration of a device formatted according to a young model. There is a, yeah, there is a certain level of fragmentation with, on, on the market. So in the true and tried spirit of open source, we decided that uh, these models are not enough, and we came up with our own. Now, jokes aside, it's the old version of the slides, but uh, doesn't matter. Uh, so there is a, uh, yeah, there is a, there is a bunch of very good reasons why we, why we, um, why we decided to implement another another young model. So first of first of all, um, we are using something that's called full disaggregation, right? We've got a um, our Rodem node consists of. Uh, Independent, independent machines, independent netcon of servers. So, for example, if uh, if we have uh, you know a six-degree rodem with two airdrop nodes, that's eight servers. That's eight netcon servers with eight separate data stores. And uh, this is not something that many of these existing models are ready for. Another feature is uh, FlexGrid. Um, so yeah, first of all, uh, by the time we started, which was in 2016 or 2017, I think, for example, the public release of OpenRodem did not support FlexGrid at all, at least as far as I remember. So, uh, this has changed, of course, but still. Um, we, so there is a certain property of the Yang model. Um, the Yang data model uh, should, in theory, be able to provide you with enough information to be able to decide if you're looking at the configuration snippet, whether that configuration makes sense or whether it is illegal. So for example, in theory, it would be nice to have Yank to check whether you're trying to route overlapping channels to the same port. Well, overlapping channels to two different ports, right? Because this is something which does not make sense in the optical domain. Uh, this is, to the best of my knowledge, something which none of these models really support. So we, we, we actually wanted to play with this. Um, another thing is that there is a lot of complexity, especially in some of these models. And um, we are really trying to find something simpler. So uh, yeah, this is essentially our, our, our model. Because we, we don't really care at this level about the OTN terminology, about OTSIs. And you know, all that matters for us is a concept of a media channel. So we start by defining the list of media channels which might be overlapping, that's fine. So this is a list of channels that this Rodem is gonna be working with, because once again, this is flex rate, and uh, yeah, it's not enough to use numbers one to 96 anymore. Then we, then we define routing of these media channels. Um, and of course, we can support uh, asymmetric uh, connections because uh, it comes very handy. And this is, this is it. Then we also need something to, to monitor perform some performance monitoring of the channels. So we've got a, um, yeah, there are essentially two pieces of information. One of them is a, a per channel power, meaning that you can, you are able to, if you are, for example, using a multi-lambda multi -lambda signal, you are able to measure these individual wavelengths independently. It's, it's no problem. And there are also some aggregate power monitors, of course. So that's, uh, yeah, maybe let's go back and one more thing uh, which I forgot to say. Um, so this was an experiment on our side. And we, we, we were thinking, okay, if this fails for some reason, if it's uh, like uh, too simple, we can always just replace our, you know, not about API implementation with something else. So far this hasn't been needed, but uh, yeah, it's always the possibility here. Um, what is inside, of course, it's, uh, it's Linux. It's, uh, it was really fun to get it working. I got something like 20 patches in Linux kernel. It was awesome experience. <laughs> it's an embedded Linux system. So, um, but on the other hand, it's something like a dual core ARM CPU with a gigabyte of memory. So it's got plenty of horsepower to run your usual glibc user land with systemd, and we love it. It's it's awesome. Um, but still, it's an embedded Linux, which means that uh, we aren't using, uh, I don't know, Fedora, or RHEL, or Debian to, as a distribution. We are generating images via BuildRoot, which is a tool that's uh, really great for this purpose. We're using Grog for system updates, and so on, and so on. The NetConf and Yang stack, it's uh, something which is based on C3PO and NetoPeer projects. 
Um, so these originated by a, a project that I think was uh, funded by uh, Deutsche Telekom and Cisco. These days it's being co-maintained by Sysnet, so Sysnet is putting quite a lot of resources into this server implementation. It's based in C, it's got a plenty of language bindings and so on. It's essentially a server implementation of a young data store with a NetConf interface. Oh yeah, <clears throat> we also implemented an interactive CLI console. Uh, that's, that's a tool which, uh, which connects to your Yang data store via NetConf. It, uh, it retrieves the Yang data models and it builds you interactively a CLI with uh, tab completion and interactive help that sort of stuff based on the shape of the NetConf model. So yeah, once again, one more reason, if this is gonna be your like interface for configuring the, this machine, one more reason to have a very simple Yang model, as simple as possible. And yes, because we are operating some of the older devices in our network, and because we know the people who are actually operating them, we wanted to design something that's uh, reliable. So which means even in this prototype stage, we're using hotspot, server grade, server grade uh, PSUs, the fan tray at the rear is replaceable by removing two screws, and software-wise, the, the flash memory inside is split into two halves, right? And uh, the system by default runs from the first slot, or one slot, and the, whenever you're updating the system, you write the fu full release to the other slot. When, it times, when it's time to, to reboot, to upgrade, you upgrade to the other slot, and there is, a, you know, there is a bunch of circuitry and software tricks to ensure that unless this system really works, unless it really gets you to a usable state, the system will automatically revert in something like five minutes, I think, to the previous release. So, uh, yes, um, it, it's a pity that there is a bunch of missing slides because I really wanted to highlight the no, doesn't, doesn't matter. I mean, I'm a little light in this. Um, I really wanted to uh, highlight the, 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 like the interaction between, uh, between what I'm doing here and what the ODTN is. So, um, a, uh, so the thing is, what we have right now, maybe I can go a little, a few slides back. Sorry for this once again. Yes, but there was a nice picture. So what we have, what we have right now is the ability to control all of these individual boxes separately, right? That's uh, awesome, it's uh, very good for flexibility. We actually built a bunch of demos which really explored this thing and, and show the power of this thing, it's really great. But I suspect that what most people actually want to do is that they would like to have this thing, this open line system controller, control, controller sorry, <laughs> uh, with an internet-based interface to provide you lambdas. And I actually think that what like, even more people want is to have a system or the system which controls the wall optical layer, including the transponders. And this is it. This is the place where we are hoping to actually tap into the uh, wider ODTN ecosystem. Let me go a few slides forward. Someone updating these slides behind this? Sorry. <laughs> so yes, this is the picture I was waiting for. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, so anyway, okay, sorry for this. So uh, let's go to a summary, right? Um, what, what do we have achieved? Um, so first of all, uh, we created a bunch of prototypes. Uh, these are uh, we, th these are ready. These, these have been working for, I think, one year. We showcased them a year ago at a TIP Summit. And uh, we got a paper out of it, which describes the design and the architecture in much more detail. It's an open access paper, so everybody is free to download it. It's at no cost, at no cost. And um, yeah, our our motivation here is to is to um, get people building these devices and bringing them to the market because we would love to be able to buy them. Um, one thing which is missing at this, at this at this point in time is this OLS controller or well some software that will be able to, treat, to control all of, orchestrate all of these boxes together. And I think that ODTN is an excellent candidate because uh, it already supports transponders, transponder control. It already supports, a, uh, it already supports or will support very soon integration with uh, TIPS uh, Telecom Info Project's uh, GNPy for performance estimation. So it makes a lot of sense to to work with ODTN here. Um, we essentially have two options, either to extend the low-level device drivers with support for our straightforward tank model, that's one option, or we could deliver a, uh, a TEPI implementation which talks to our boxes. I think that's also a very viable path. 
So yes, um, as I tried to say, <clears throat> what we are really looking for here is uh, collaboration. That's why we are members of the TIP project at Cessnet. That's why we are members of OpenRODEM. That's why we are active within the IETF community. That's why I came here. And uh, yes, that's why we showed this demo at the TIP Summit last year, with, uh, which also shows that you can use the optical fiber for much more stuff than just carrying the data. And uh, yeah, that's uh, why I'd like to take any questions here. Are there any questions for Jan? That's right, yes. Aha, uh -huh. now I pronounced it right. <laughs> any questions? No? If uh, not, I might have a comment. I think that um, you showed two possible integration with, uh, with ODTN. I think that uh, the, fir the first prototype can be done with your proprietary Yang model. Um, you're more than welcome to contribute the driver. Mm -hmm. uh, the driver subsystem in order is not tied to particularly anything. Obviously, with the service providers, we're pushing open Rotom for That's the right. Rotom itself. So that could be the follow-up section. But just to, to see that integration, the first step could be uh, a um, specific driver with your model. Uh, as a step stone to show that it's possible, and then uh, as soon as more resources can come in, you could move either to TAPI with a um, piece in the middle or to open Rotom for your own box. That's, that's really up to you. So that's, that would be my pick, and I would be very interested to collaborate if you guys want. Oh, uh, yes. I think we can sure. definitely have these in place of, uh, or uh, um, in collaboration with the Lumentum ones in the demo I have here. I think we can achieve the same exact demo on top of yours too. So yeah, that would yeah. be great. Thank you. Okay. Rodem, probably one of the other aspect would be using both these together to interrupt, mm -hmm. right? Um, would that be possible? Yes, absolutely. Um, so what we um, what we are trying to do here is to achieve the full disaggregation, and you know when I say full disaggregation, there are still there, you know, reasonable people could be imagining different things under this term. So because what we have here is a one rec unit pizza box per each uh, subsystem of a rodem. We've got a, uh, we've got, uh, of course, we are integrating amplifiers and, uh, and e so EDFAs and WSS in one chassis, that's right. But we've got a one U module per each line direction, one uh, rec U module for a drop. So uh, yeah, there is, <laughs> there is no reason to stick with just these systems. I mean, combining just these modules in one road and note, I can't see any reason why why not to use, for example, Lumentum white box. That's right, yes. Maybe I can say something about this internal structure, if sure. I have this picture here. So the thing, uh, the silver shiny thing here, it's the wavelength selective switch which uh, actually performs the wavelength uh, manipulation, routing, and selective attenuation. Um, this is the, the black thing here. It's an amplifier, an EDFA. These are, of course, power supplies. This is the, so this is some custom PCB with uh, electronic for interfacing to the optical modules. And there is a, um, an ARM, ARM uh, computer here with the SFP cage for the, for the, uh, for the OSC signal. And there is actually also a channel monitor that's hidden on the other side of the board. You might be wondering, what is this shiny blue thing? It's, uh, I think, it just holds the air with uh, and some trays with fusion splices. Yeah. And uh, yes, there will be the updated slides will be available on uh, on the website with a little more information about how exactly we would like to, where where exactly we see the value of collaboration with uh, with ODTN. And uh, yeah, there are some. You can just download them and see the, the internal optical schematics if you're interested. Thank you.